The answer came in the next generation of synthesizers, with a computer memory capable of remembering which notes are played on the keyboard. Here, the musician will have both hands free to shape the finished sound of the sequence. Malcolm Clark. Well, that tune is now recorded, but recorded not on tape, but in a memory system, and has recorded the control voltages that control all synthesizers. Unfortunately, I made a mistake in playing the piece, but we can go back. And this is what I did. I can ask it to stop. That note, unfortunately, is incorrect. Now, by pressing that button, we can hear it's gone. If we play back, there's a hole where it was. So what I'm going to do is going to put it in. Now that's recorded, but the quality of the sound is not at all as I want it. And this is one of the reasons I've put it in the sequencer, so that my hands are now free to concentrate on the sound quality. Um, because I'm working with the melody in mind, as well as the sound quality, I'm going to put another piece of information in to ask the memory to repeat. We can speed it up if we want to. No, it's going very fast now. Working on this sound pattern now, what I want to try and achieve is the sound quality that is described in a science fantasy play which is about uh, a house which is completely automatic and uh, I'll just stop the melody for a moment while I'm talking uh, what happens when the house becomes dirty is not ordinary vacuum cleaners come out but tiny robot cleaning mice made of rubber and metal and they have moustaches that they twirl to pick up the crumbs and little bits and pieces because the, the sound of a miniature mouse vacuum cleaner uh, isn't at all like a, a sine wave that we're hearing at the moment, I'm going to change over to our old friend White Noise. And it's going through a filter. Here it is. You can hear the notes, but they're not pitched at all, so I'm going to tighten the filter. That's the sort of whistling sound that I want, but in order to get the idea of a vacuum motor speeding up and slowing down as they do, I want to um, put another voltage in so that the, the note changes its pitch as it's sounding. And because this will take time, I'm going to slow the tune down a little bit. I'm going to change the shape of the notes here and introduce this That's more like a vacuum cleaner. It's got the sort of feel about it, but it still doesn't have that whirling moustache sound that I particularly want. I think the best way to achieve that is to vary the loudness of the sound very quickly with another oscillator. And I can do that here. There we are. Now, we go through once again. I'm going to ask it to stop at the end, and I'm going to put a long decay. There's a long decay. That's the sound of the mouse disappearing back into its burrow. Here, a futuristic sound is about to be created for a door in Doctor Who. First, the original sound in the studio. Wait here, please. Instead of scraping along, the door must sound as if it glides. Dick Mills first generates some white noise as part of the new sound he'll dub over the original soundtrack. Having timed the movement of the door, he can now modify the white noise
to the precise pitch and quality he requires. And here it is. He's now ready to dub the new sound over the original. Wait here, please. Often the workshop composers, like Roger Lim, first try out their ideas on a conventional piano. was to experiment on a keyboard synthesizer to select the most appropriate types of sound. Such instruments can not only simulate everything from a harpsichord or violin to a full brass band, but can also create an almost infinite variety of the shapes of sound we saw earlier. Sounds of instruments as yet uninvented. Here, the object was to achieve some fairly wild noises which might be used as the climax for the titles of this film. The idea was gradually to modify a piece which would begin with conventional instruments. You ready, John? Ready when you are. One, two, three. Roger Lim now replayed the piece through earphones. Then at the right moment, without singing, he used his speaking voice to trigger the synthesizer, adding words to the tune of the saxophone. Here, the problem facing the composer was a sequence of images filmed for Jonathan Miller's series, The Body in Question. The producer wanted music to match a ticking clock, which could run unobtrusively behind commentary, and yet establish a sense of the 17th century as stylishly as possible. We pick up the story where composer Peter Howell has just been told about this sequence by producer Patrick Uden, and is beginning to discuss his first ideas with him. Yeah, so that's, that's your actual clock, and yeah. we, we, we're locked to that. We're locked to it. We, um, Steve's already cut some pictures to it, yes. Right. So there's no way of altering the no. tempo of that. Yeah. So what you want is... We could alter the... Uh, I mean, you could double it, I suppose. Yes. Or, or, or but something. The pictures, for example, don't cut directly no, on right. the beat all the time. Right. Um, but you're really talking about uh, having that behind the music that's covering the sequence. Yes, yes. There's a bit... Slow. The first, <laughs> yeah. the first thing that occurs. It's a very to me accurate is clock, actually. Yeah, <laughs> not a slow clock. The yeah. fact that um, you know you tend to work to sort of um, tempos that you're used to working to, and that does sound a bit slow to me. Or well, in fact, if you um, if you were to do sort of triplets over each mm. beat, so it goes tick. I don't think so. I, I, um, the sort of thing I was thinking of was much more, it was sort of, um, well, Purcell-ish. I mean, that's the sort of thing that Jonathan's yes. been talking about. Yes. Um, um, can I play it? Can yeah, you do it okay. To yes. It? yes, if you that, mm, um, it's got to be that steady pace. Well, we yes. can make the most of that by having um, sort of slightly doubled um, yes. bass line to speed it up a bit. Um, it's got to be fairly stately.
think that's, that's, I think that, that's, that's doesn't sound nice, actually. Now, the only other thing, of course, is that it's got to be... At the moment, we don't know how long this sequence is going to run, because Jonathan hasn't written the script yet. But uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to have to... I would imagine it'll run for something like two and a half minutes. So yeah. it's obviously going to have well, to sustain... Well, that's rather nice, actually. It yes. makes a nice change to actually have that length of time to play with, because yes. it means with a broad tune, you can actually get it to go somewhere. To achieve the effect of a chorus, Peter Howell tried out his own voice over the music track. So, using his voice, the synthesizer, and a multi-track recorder, the various elements of the piece are built up, layer by layer. One solo performer turning his composition into a complete orchestral work. Mm -hmm. 